yeah. rolling. Episode seven, Throning and Friends. We have Belinda, middle name? Marie. Marie. Oh, yeah. Everybody has Marie. Marie. Yeah. Belinda Marie Barber. Outstanding. Yeah. Woohoo. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. So, okay, I mean, we just got to get this out there right now. Okay. So, you posted on Instagram this week that you attended clown camp. I mean, I literally out loud went, what is clown camp? I did. <laughs> yep. So You were juggling, right? In the picture? That's how I learned how to juggle, was through clown camp. I also learned <laughs> how to do like face painting and how to fall properly and how to jump and land over things and how to fall downstairs and make it look funny. We like wore outfits. Can you make animals out of balloons? Oh. No. Make me a bicycle clown. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> I did not. We did not get that far. I mean, it was like a half day camp. I think it was nine to... One Why or something. Why our face for regionals? Like you have this closet because it was because was she's not using her face for regionals. Yeah. Well, when I was little, <laughs> I wanted to do everything that my older siblings did, and my brother actually was a paid at parties clown. Oh. And he did it. Everybody called him Crash. Like not everybody can name. say that. Nope. Crash. Yeah. I can't say that. Crash, Crash the clown. is a good name. Yeah. He was great. He was like Crash super clumsy. He's like long and super limmy, like I am, and he wasn't. He didn't immediately get the athletic gene in his body, so he fell all the time. And when he played sports, he just fell over all the time. So then he kind of used it for his benefit and got really good at yo-yos and juggling. I mean, he could juggle, like, odd objects. I could only juggle like little fire? balls or... Chainsaws? Like spears? Mm, I don't know if we got to chainsaws or spears, but definitely fruits and That's pretty cool. pins. That's close. And, but he, like, pins would go cool. around Great places could kill and you. be a I clown. Can... And I thought it was cool yeah. because I wanted to do everything my siblings did, so I went to clown camp. How old were you? I think I was, like... 10, 9 or 10. Wow. In the summer, it was a summer camp for five days. I didn't know they had clown camp. I, I didn't know no that idea. was a... I, mean, <laughs> I didn't I, either until I went to baseball time. camp in the summers, but <laughs> never clown that's, camp. That's yeah, impressive. I went to a lot of soccer camps and then clown camp and acting camp acting for a week. Camp. Wow. Yeah. Acting camp. I thought I wanted to be Diverse. an actress for a while, and then I realized I was really bad at it. So <laughs> Tell us about soccer. You and like soccer. Like the sport? No, you know, just you and <laughs> you soccer. No, there's this thing called soccer, and I... am interested in soccer. Right, yeah. Kick a ball. I played... Uh, essentially every sport growing up. I was on a jump rope team for eight years. I was on, I played soccer, I played basketball, I played volleyball, essentially through eighth grade. And then I had to essentially come to the realization that I'm not good at the other sports. I wasn't actually very hand-eye coordinated because I loved soccer the most, the most. And again, my sister played soccer and I wanted to be good just like she was. So when it came to after eighth grade and I got to high school, I started playing soccer exclusively. So I played on, when I was a freshman, I was asked up to the varsity team, so I played for four years on the varsity team in high school, and I also played uh, competitive, so it was essentially all year long, and I played my whole life and then got recruited to play at the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio for two years, and then after those two years, I kind of realized that the program that I was in, I just fell out of love with playing in the sport, and it was becoming such a headache of a job, and I wasn't enjoying it anymore that I decided it wasn't the right path for me. So then I quit the varsity team and then played on the club team for my junior and senior year. At right on. Wow. So what was it like growing up in the barber household? I mean, you talk about clown camp and all your siblings and I know you're, you talk about them all the time. So. Yeah. I mean, I love, I had a wonderful childhood. There's nothing that I can complain about with it. I have the most wonderfully supportive parents to the fact that I got to do things like clown camp and acting <laughs> yeah. camp and anything cool. essentially that we were like, I want to try this. Be that's why I have so many different weird experiences is because yeah. anytime that we were like, oh, I want to try this out, they're like, cool, let's figure out how to do it. I also played the drums for six years. So like I've done a lot of stuff because it was things that I thought were cool and they were very accepting of, well, if you think it's cool, let's try it and let's see how it goes. My sister and brother did the same thing. They, I don't think they ventured out quite as much as I did. I think I was, I'm just such an active brain person, obviously, which is why I love doing this now, that I wanted to try everything. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to be involved in everything. Everything that I thought would be neat, I wanted to see if I could be good at it or try it. So I did it. But they were wonderfully supportive. My dad is a defense attorney, so we were also <laughs> very stubborn, headstrong family <laughs> to the point that we had family dinners as much as possible until we got older every single night together the family but had to have a dictionary and thesaurus right next to us this is like before the internet really because we would have debates and we would have to like find the actual answer because everyone would have their own opinion and stick to it even if they knew that they were wrong you would yeah. stick to that answer so we've all also grown up to be very loving but like not afraid to tell you what you think and to give your opinion on things and to be very straightforward stubborn hardworking people do you want to share about like your toys and the bike why you couldn't ride a bike oh <laughs> so I also okay so in um 
the light of trying everything, there was a few <laughs> things that I did not try. She couldn't ride a bike. She couldn't <laughs> jump on a trampoline. I did. Well, we weren't allowed to have a trampoline. So that's the other part of my dad being a defense attorney is that when he did, when he had lawsuits against cool toys, we weren't allowed to have them. So we got like a zip line one year from Christmas and we weren't allowed to do it. We had to give a bag. We had a trampoline in our backyard and he was like, yeah, nope, too many lawsuits against that. So anything that was like cool, fun toys, we weren't allowed to have them. So I didn't really ride a bike. I didn't own a bike. I did have a skateboard. Blows I just didn't mind. have a bike. We had, I played a lot of soccer. I did a lot of running and my, the friends that were in our neighborhood were literally two houses away. So, mm -hmm. and we had a pool that was less than a quarter mile down the street. So the, and we walked to and from school. So I didn't ride a bike anywhere. I knew how to do it, mm -hmm. but I was not comfortable on it. So like two years ago when we started riding a bike, <laughs> I literally am death gripping the hell out of the handle <laughs> and I can't go a mile without being terrified of something so I've gotten much better since Your then progress and is incredible but I'd never been on a road bike I never wore clip-ins I've never shifted a gear I had no idea how to do any of that I also climbed a couple trees in life but I'm also not outdoorsy <laughs> you I hate, never loved you actually hate the outdoors <laughs> which is so funny kind like, of hate the outdoors for a crossfit athlete I, I don't know I feel like that was like a shock like did, I mean, does that shock you hearing mm -hmm. that about Lindy? Yeah. That she doesn't like being outside? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't. I went skiing twice and I like fell off and hurt myself both times. So I think there's like adventure so give it sports. Up. Give yeah. it up. <laughs> <laughs> if it's hard, give it up. Okay, That's that what you take away from this. If I don't <laughs> like it and it doesn't make me happy, then yeah, then I'm not going to do it anymore. And camping and bugs and outside. Spiders. You love spiders. Oh, God, I can't. We can't. I'm going to sweat. <gasps> I got Can a, we not? I got a random fact about spiders. This should make you like them more. That's not true. I don't even want to hear it. Yeah. But it, no, I want to know how like you feel about them this. More. There is like them more. there's a vegetarian spider don't that care. only eats leaves and it's in Costa Rica. Well, you don't why, so why don't you like them? Then? I don't know. There was some there had to have been some traumatic experience you. at some point in my life that it happened and it doesn't matter what kind it is. Hmm. It doesn't matter that. that it's a vegetarian spider. Cuz it's not going to bite you. It doesn't want to eat you. It won't eat you. Well, however, most spiders don't eat people. Wait, they eat you other hear insects. all the time in the Hold news. On. That spider, that the spider that ate the person. That person so no, but then it wouldn't consumed. be like a nibble on you, no? No. Why? It's a defense mechanism, I'm pretty sure, when they bite you. So you think vegetarian spiders bite? I, yeah. I doubt it. Man. I think they eat grass. Of course they do. Fact check. They're, I think no. that if they are on your epidermis, no. they're like, this is all not right, something that you Here we go, epidermis. Your skin. <laughs> your skin. Just Thank say your skin. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, while you're fact checking, I would like to know what Lindy, cause yes. your family always has super cool traditions and you guys as well. Do you have any Thanksgiving traditions um, or, or anything you guys, what do you do for Thanksgiving? We're way more Christmas tradition than we are Thanksgiving. We always have a family get together. We do Thanksgiving lunch. So we mm -hmm. get together as so my dad's whole family is from Kentucky. He was born in Springfield, which is a, essentially a city, a smaller city that's outside of Louisville, which is mm -hmm. where we live now. Most of them now live in Louisville because it's a bigger city and there was more to do there, but they grew up on a farm. And every Thanksgiving, we always get together with my dad's side in Kentucky for Thanksgiving lunch and hang out. The only really tr like tradition tradition is that we always pick Christmas Pollyanna on Thanksgiving. So like usually we, there was, my dad's one of six and then a couple of them were remarried. So there's mm -hmm. so many cousins mm -hmm. that we always did. We don't really do it as much anymore because we're all grown up, but we always did a Pollyanna where you just picked a cousin's name out mm -hmm. of the hat. So then that was a main tradition, like after eating, then someone, whoever that year was in charge of yeah. writing everybody's names down and going around and counting it and like announcing who you had for <laughs> yeah. Christmas. Um, but that was really the main tradition. Other than that, my mom makes, um, oyster clam chowder every Ooh, single year wow so we always have thanksgiving lunch and then everybody like you know hangs out and naps and plays football and stuff in the afternoon and then she always brings out this oyster clam chowder which is essentially just her thing and mm. it's been an, i don't like it and she actually doesn't like it so she doesn't <laughs> eat it but she makes it for everybody yeah. and everyone expects thanksgiving lunch and then oyster clam chowder yeah. in the after or in the evening afternoon before you go home that's cool though that's still a tradition yeah so there's a couple we're way bigger christmas traditions than we are actual thanksgiving traditions just like everybody else, you just get together and eat a yeah. whole yeah. ton of food. Yeah. All the family shows up. I, I never cook ever. It's just not my thing. But I make a date pudding mm -hmm. and a pineapple salad. Ooh, and it's a tradition. Good. And I those are two things I can do pretty good. And everybody comes for that. And I like that. That's what they come for? Yeah. <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> just date pudding. Those two things. <laughs> everybody in the whole family shows up for mine. You better do a good job on those two. That's exactly right. I put that out there. Um, there's actually nothing 
talking about it does say there's only one vegetarian spider out of 40,000. You guys, I'm like creeped out already. But it <laughs> also like stop this conversation. The, one of the questions on there though is is it unvegan to kill a spider? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny, but it's pretty funny. I, don't know. I told you about the spider in Africa, didn't I? Oh, no, don't oh don't God. do it. Can She's going to freak yeah, out. I'm gonna She's take, gonna I'm leave. Seriously She's going to leave. <laughs> it was as big as my Please, hand. Can we not? Like we can't. <laughs> this is I know I can't deal with this right now. Do you cook anything for Thanksgiving? You love to cook. Yes. I do like cooking. Uh, I have not. I'm afraid you're showing me something. I'm not that. showing you. <laughs> um, I'm not showing you. <laughs> I have not. I think last year I might have made a dessert, but traditionally I haven't made anything for Thanksgiving. I might this year. Okay. I haven't like considered myself an adult enough to bring a side dish. You could try pineapple salad or date yeah. pudding. Or, I'll save some know. for you. What do you cook? Uh, sweet potato casserole. Oh. Ooh. You and put I, the marshmallows and I help with on the, the turkey. Top? No, I do. I like the. Uh, the like pecans or like candied pecans or yeah. whatever on top. I'm more of that that style. Lots of sugar, a lot of brown sugar. <laughs> well, yeah. That's why it's, it's delicious. delicious. Makes everything so all right. delicious. Yeah, no, I don't like the mushroom top. I don't know. It's not my marshmallow, marshmallow top. I was mushroom. Like, gross. Mushroom. <laughs> mushroom on top of uh, sweet potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like them. Yeah. Marsh- I don't really like marshmallows. Marshmallow. Uh, that much. I, I like them just, in like, s'mores. You know, that's yeah, it. Right, and that's it. Yeah, and then you grill it. them and yeah. roast good to go. Sheesh. So on CrossFit subject, what was your best memory of CrossFit, like, you know, the season last year? And can you talk a little bit about uh, Team Darren, Team Lindy? (laughs) That's my favorite memory. (laughs) I don't know if it was team or just a battle all year long. (laughs) Explain Um, what that is or was. So essentially that started, well, it kind of started when Darren got added onto the team last year because then I loved the fact that I was no longer the newbie. I was no longer the new person. I, we did not actually get to carry around banners last year. Mm. I was just excited for Darren to have to be the one to be in charge of the banner because I was in charge of the banner and was terrible at it the year before. You were pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah, I, was almost not, lost the I lost it. The you banner's guys took actually it. in the basement. I found it the other day. Oh, oh good. Yeah. See, there it is. I was right scroll. where I put it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then I was really excited and kind of gave him crap for a while in the beginning of the season about being the new guy and, you know, having to hold up mm-hmm. whatever, all this, all the team morale. And then it got to regionals and we had a workout that was – the running, handstand push-ups, and dumbbell snatches. And essentially it all started here because Darren and I were chosen (laughs) to go last, which means that we were bringing up the rear of all three pairs, and we essentially were the deciding factor who, or what our team time was. But of course it was on the last person. Whoever finished last Mm -hmm. was the person who finished the entire workout for us. So then he and I went back and forth and every single time in practice we were pretty close or we would go back and forth or I would get, he would get ahead of me on the, on the handstand (laughs) pushups and I would catch him on the dumbbell snatches. But at no time in practice did I ever actually beat him in the, our own section. He always finished the workout first and I was a couple seconds behind him, but we kept telling him all practices that just wait until regionals comes and I'm going to get you and it's going to be me. And essentially we're not going to be competing against anybody else. It's literally just going to be me versus you when we get on that air runner. So like regionals, of course, I think he got a little excited. This is the very first workout. This is his very first time competing with us officially as a team. And he gets on this air, the air runner and he like books it. Like he gets yeah. off pretty quickly. He's off. He's on upside down before I even get off the air runner. So at this point I'm like, okay, whatever. Literally actually thinking these thoughts in my head that I'm competing against Darren at this point. It's like, well, I have to like really book it on the handstand pushups yeah. and I have no choice, but just, just go as hard as possible on the dumbbell snatches. So I get to the handstand pushups and I think he gets off too ahead of me maybe. So I'm running, like run to the dumbbell and I'm just hammering these dumbbells as much as possible. Thank goodness at this point we're like way in the lead of our whole heat. So it literally can just be me versus Darren. And I catch him with, 10 to go or so and I think I pass him on our last transition up do my last couple and then beat him and I, he, he legitimately was genuinely mad at me a little it's, bit at it's the end still of like it. a running rivalry and if you look at the pictures from regionals there's one like one of the most excited pictures of all of us like where we're all jumping up and down in the background is because Part of us are Team Lindy and part of us are Team Darren, and we know what's going on. We talked any, about. Like, I don't think anybody really chose a side. I did. The oh. girls did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Way to I was go. fully supporting. <laughs> Way to go, Ellie. Way to well, separate the team there. there. No, good job. <laughs> I love them all. The funny thing is, is in practice, Darren, every time we did handstand push-ups, did all 32 unbroken. Crushed. Every yeah. single time. And so we were like, all right, Darren, you're doing the 32. And when he got out there, he nope. like 24 <laughs> – I'm pretty sure six, he did three sets and I did two. two. Yeah, I think yeah. he went 24, six and two. Like he started, me and Matt are watching him and when he, you can see somebody start like <laughs> trembling as they're going up. I was like, this is not good. This Came is not a little good. Hot. He went out real hot. Yeah. 
you're just excited but it all worked out so it was all good fun yeah, it mean, just turned into and uh, the uh, our crowd essentially knew also what was going on so when I finished we hadn't even finished the workout Darren was still going they started cheering because like I had finally beat Darren in this workout but <laughs> it was good fun except for him he actually was mad at me <laughs> That was a good push. Honestly. Yeah, it was fun. You it was know. a good workout. So you said that um, kind of towards the end of college, you fell out of love with soccer. When was it that you kind of fell in love with CrossFit, and what is it about CrossFit that makes you wake up every day and want to do it? So I, I did. I the program at Dayton, the girls and the players were great, and I loved them, but I just didn't love the coaching and the attitude about the sport that I was receiving. I had always played because I love to play and I wanted to be better and I had a drive and a desire to actually be the best soccer player as possible. I mean, I had the same goals for soccer as I do for CrossFit now is to be the best I can, to go as far as I can, to get as high level as possible. Of course, my dream was like to be on the national team and yeah. go to the Olympics, but I started to very quickly realize through college, like this is not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. So when it became more of a chore for me than a happy point of my life, something that I did not look forward to anymore, then I quit my Se the spring semester of my sophomore year. So I completed the two years and then stopped and started to do club, which was awesome because these girls were showing up because they loved to play, not because they were getting paid to play, not because they mm -hmm. had to, not because they didn't have a choice. So it was way, it brought back the just playing for fun, actually like real intensity in games because you had emotion backed up by mm -hmm. it, which I loved. So I did that for the two years, essentially at the end of my senior years, when I knew that soccer was ending, um, I had the injury that I had and I had to was no longer allowed to play soccer. So, which is when CrossFit kind of took over mm -hmm. and I started doing CrossFit because I didn't know what else to do. And I was in a gym and I was running five miles and I was doing like lunges and abs in the corner. Yeah. Cause that was essentially what I had been taught to do overall. And then the owner of the gym invited me over to do this thing called CrossFit. So mm -hmm. I did a CrossFit class. And then when I thought that I was in shape and then was completely crushed and was getting <laughs> beat by like 40 year old women, I was yeah. like, wow, okay. So then I realized that this was something that I can still be better. This is something else that is athletic that I can find and get better at and mm -hmm. become a better athlete overall. So I just fell in love with it quickly. And I loved not knowing how to do so many things and feeling like there was still so much room for me to get better as an athlete, as a person through CrossFit itself. Yeah. And then I found out I could be competitive and then all bets were off and, and that's when everything hurt. took off. Yeah. When did the back injury take place? Because I think that's a really cool part of your story about how you really learned to work around that, work through that. It was in 2011. So it was um, the spring. It was actually the first year of the Open, the online Open. And I was two weeks into the Open when I broke my back and then had to drop out. Well, I think it was actually the start of the third week. I had completed two weeks. It was the start of the third week. It was one that there was burpees over the bar, overhead squats and muscle ups. Yeah. Mm. And I remember that because I was so worried about the over, I didn't even know that I could burpee over the bar and I did not have a muscle up at this time. 60, 30, 10 something or something like, like that, that yeah. for NAM wrap. But it was that week. And I think there was a third week. So I was two weeks in, had completed the first two weeks, was doing really well. And then broke my back that Monday of the third week of the 2011 open. So then I couldn't complete it anymore. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I feel like so you have shared your backstory with all, you know, all of us and so many people, but I think there's a story even behind that about, I mean, you faced adversity after adversity after adversity. Um, I mean, how did you overcome all of that? And do you apply that to why you can perform so well in CrossFit? And do you apply that to your daily life or no? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that essentially I've been told twice, which is the, f the first story that most people don't know is my wrist. So I was in a car accident, like a really bad car accident, my senior year of high school. And I had to be essentially rushed into surgery on my wrist because it was shattered. It was in pieces. So this wrist is actually, it's fake. So it's plates and screws that are holding the bones together and it's crooked. I don't really know if you can see it, <laughs> but it's like, it? it's sideways crooked. You can see it when oh, I hold oh, it yeah, out, you can see the yeah. little. which is why I always wear one wrist wrap on this side is to hold it straight. So when I do movements, it's not, I'm not trying to like snatch like this. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that it took me two years to be able to pour a gallon of milk. I couldn't turn a doorknob. I was in a huge cast for, I think it was two full months and then a soft cast for another month. And I had to go through therapy to learn, essentially to relearn how to use my hand. So that was the first time that I was told I wouldn't lift weights, that I wouldn't be able to do all this, that my life was never going to be normal. And if I break it again, then kind of I'm kind of screwed and I won't be able to use it. So that was the first one. So coming back from that, essentially I was still a soccer player. So I always wore a wrist brace in case I fell on it, but that wasn't directly affecting what I was doing. There was some stuff in the weight room that I wasn't allowed to mm -hmm. do or that I just opted out of because it didn't matter at that point. But then going into CrossFit, I was dealing with this already because I didn't have range of motion. So I was doing push-ups on dumbbells and turning upside down on dumbbells and I mm -hmm. couldn't actually do a lot of the lifts until I got the mobility back in my wrist. 
And then I broke my back, which is, of course, a whole new thing, which affects a lot more overall than just your wrist does. So it was yeah. like essentially the second time, like, yes, that one was more detrimental and that was more heartbreaking because they were telling me not only was I not allowed to lift, but I couldn't squat. I couldn't do CrossFit. This new sport you would fall in love with was not for you. You can't do it. But growing up with my dad and the stubbornness and the nothing is out of your reach attitude and mm-hmm. the you can do anything you want and the if you want it, try it. And that kind of attitude instilled in me and being told that like, yeah, you can do it. Yes, you can try it. Yes, go for it. Mm-hmm. Um, has always came with me in life. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I couldn't, and I was also an exercise science student at the time. So I knew that them telling me that it was completely impossible just didn't make sense. And that not doing anything, there was no way that not doing anything was going to help the injury. And I was going to be in more pain than if I actually strengthened the muscles around it. So it was like taking what they said with a grain of salt, but also taking the education that I was getting and trying to add the two back together. And I was just, I was unwilling to give up. I didn't think that that was an option. I didn't want to sit around and do nothing. I didn't want to find something else. This is what I knew I could do. And I knew that I could do it safely if I was smart about it. So I just, I didn't give up on it. And that's kind of how I've been with everything. If something's making me unhappy and if it's ruining my quality life, then I'm not going to do it. And if it's something that I love to do, then I'm never going to give up on it. No matter how many times you tell me no. I like that. Do you have like, do you have three or four main mental kind of mindset tools that are things you go to? that are real specific no or those kind of things just, that you just talked about they're just I mean I've never had a mental coach I've never done mental strength training and honestly I don't think I need it like I think that life has given me the training that I need and I've had to adapt in so many different ways throughout just different scenarios in my life that I've learned how to mentally adapt to things and how I've become mentally stronger through these adversities in my own not like everyone says that there's like different processes of grieving. And I think for me, there's been all kinds of different processes of learning how to become mentally tough Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think any outside source would be able to make better on myself because I've done it so many times over and over again on my own way that of course I still have like crazy up and down days. And just freaking last week, like I had a day that my back was not happy. So I went home. And so those things still happen. And I would be lying if I said that they still don't get me down and I still get really frustrated. I'm like, Oh, like why does this keep happening? But I have to keep coming out of those and they're getting fewer and far between. And I get more, I'm getting, still getting better at knowing that it's okay. You're fine. You can come back in tomorrow and everything's going to be okay. And I've just developed that through proving to myself that yes, you can still do it and you always get through these things. So I think I've just developed my own mental strength. I love it. Kind of that wisdom from your own life experience through the adversity. Right. Yeah. And it's obviously like to me, it applies in way more ways than just athletics. Like this is also in relationships that are tough and situated like relational relationship situations that I've gone through that have changed my life entirely. And like friends relationships that have gotten messed up or anything in school. Like I went to grad school for a year and it was a horrible situation for me. So then I left and then, then I felt down again. So it was like, it hasn't just applied to sports specific. Those have been the most documented because that's what I do most with my life. But there's been other scenarios that are completely outside of athletics that have required the same kind of mental toughness Mm -hmm. and strength to get through that I've been able to apply essentially through everything. I think it's because you guys, the three of you guys are elite CrossFit athletes and are recognized that way, you know, the, the, how do we connect to life and how it makes us a better person thing is a really big deal, especially for the majority of people who aren't competing at an elite, you know, in a, at an elite level, like you guys are, how would you guys, and I've, I've wanted to ask you guys this, how has CrossFit made you a better person? I mean, that's a question I have for the three of you. Uh, I mean, kind of going, picking back off what she says, I think, you know, just, just, just speaking in CrossFit terms, it's, you know, you learn a lot about yourself in a workout and what you can do and you kind of figure out limits, not only physically, but also emotionally and, and mentally. And, um, I think it's just, uh, you know, overcoming adversity in a workout, you know, it's not real adversity. Let's be honest. Like once you get out of, out of the gym where, you know, that's where real adversity is, but there is some stuff to be learned and some, some things that you can take away from, um, seeing how you react when, you know, you're out of breath, you feel like you're going to die or whatever, you know, when you're doing a workout. So, um, that's just a little thing you can take out of CrossFit, Mm -hmm. you know, training, I think. Yeah. I mean, I also think, uh, definitely what he's saying mentally and physically, you just grow so much as a person and there's so much value from understanding that you always have something to learn. But I think even more than that for me personally is reappreciating the value of community and difference in people 
when you're set in this environment. Like I always tell people, it still makes the most comfortable CrossFitters in the world nervous to walk into a new CrossFit building, not knowing anybody. And every time you walk in there, you meet like-minded people that are all really different. Like, okay, they all have CrossFit in common, but maybe you're a doctor, maybe you're a janitor, maybe you're this, but you meet so many different cool people and you just learn so much about yourself and other people by going into this environment where you thought you were just going to exercise. And then you leave and you're like, man, let me tell you what I learned today from so-and-so yeah. or, you know, this walk of life. And I think CrossFit has just taught me to really be open-minded when I go into settings with new people and find a way to say like, Hey, you know, tell me about yourself. Right. That's awesome. We had a member come up the other day in the gym and he's a state policeman yeah. state and, pr- and, and he's, uh, he's, he's been on doing the job a long time. And for the first time he's in a, a real car chase with shots fired. Wow. And he's lost 50 pounds since being here and he's chasing somebody in a high pressure situation with, you know, and, and he gets out of the car and he says, I knew I was going to catch him. I flat before six months ago. I don't know. Call him back up. Yeah. <laughs> Pull yeah. out warrants. That's what he said. And he was waiting for the <laughs> angle and the person he was chasing gave him an angle and he caught him and Gosh. that, and he was just like, you guys don't understand how much this really means out here to me and to us. That's cool. Past being an athlete you know i think that's huge i think it's so super cool because we have such a different perspective and honestly i think my outside of life events have made me a better crossfitter more than crossfit has made me a better person Mm, does that make sense like Mm -hmm. i think that everything else in my life has taught me to be a better crossfitter right um but I think it's really cool because our struggles in the gym are like worried about regionals and worried about whatever, as opposed to this gym member who's legitimately trying to use CrossFit to make himself a better police officer to protect his community better. Or worried about his life. Yeah. Worried about his or life. Yeah. His in own. like such a cool way that like, yeah. yes, like what we do is like flashy and it's sexy and it's on TV, but like those are the really awesome stories about CrossFit. What yeah, we do exactly. is entertainment. It's not, yeah. It's not yeah. like, yeah, it's not real life like we're just working really hard to go work really hard somewhere else in another venue for other people's enjoyment right (laughs) really so it's like i think those stories are a thousand times cooler and that's why i love sharing my backstories because it's relatable to 90 percent of the people that like walk into gyms like they have injuries they have problems so i love talking to people about it and people are always like sorry i don't want to ask you questions but i would rather help them because i feel like they're they're overcoming and feeling the same frustrations and struggles and stuff that we feel in, yep. a, in almost in a more realistic way. Like they are worried about their back pain because they can't go pick up their four year old toddler at home later. Right. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of stuff that they're trying to come to the gym to get stronger for real life scenarios. And I think that's so cool to hear stories. Absolutely. Like that. You guys have like, um, the three of you, you know, in common share a really unique intensity in getting to work out and be around you guys, there's this really unique in intensity about you and competitiveness. And I was cracking up the other day when you guys were deadlifting and, and she was telling you, Hey, stop thinking. Hmm. And I don't know what was going on with you. Do you remember what I'm talking that about? Oh, I know, yeah, I know. Exactly that happens a lot about. with Ellie. We and, were, we were working up to a heavy single. Oh, and I was just adding weight to the bar, and Ellie kept asking, like, should I do this? And how, how much is on here? What is this? Is what are we doing? And I was like, Ellie, like that. I was like, Ellie, just stop. Just stop. Just stop worrying about it. Walk up to the bar, put your hands on it, and lift it. Like, mm-hmm. just don't worry about anything else. Yeah. And then she ended up lifting a lot more than she would have had I told her it was 305 pounds. My like, hamstring insertions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I wasn't trying to be critical well, no, and make fun. My but- curiosity can be a detriment. I understand that. Like, I am so curious. I want to understand everything all the time. Right. And most of the time, there really isn't an answer. Right. So there is an well, answer, but it's not true, really yeah. one that we need to go into depth to explain to you. Like it's not something that you need to worry about to go to lift that deadlift. Like, like yesterday, who cares pushing about all the these thousand things? Yeah, just freaking just lift but, the weight. But just which pick foot do I put forward? Right. It's like it doesn't well, matter. If, I, if there's optimization fast. happening there, I'm just trying to understand how to optimize it. <laughs> optimization. <laughs> <laughs> Big fancy words. I, but but I, that's I, what I was thinking. I, I was thinking just in in getting to know you and being around you <laughs> that there is a really unique intensity about you when you compete. You know, yeah. that's just laser focus and, and almost if there's too much talk, it annoys you. Let's not talk so much about this. Let's just go to work. Yeah. You know, like let's stop thinking about this and let's just move the weight, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I had to, I kind of adapted with that initially early because my, when, after I broke my back, I did not let go of the dream. I still want to go to the games. I still want to be a games athlete. So I kept working for it. I was lucky enough to have a coach at the time. His name is Jeff Tincher. So he was coaching me through it and had taken on the huge, massive responsibility of not only essentially being my CrossFit coach, but my mental coach through coming back from my back injury. 
but he was a huge reason of the why that I am the athlete that I am, the CrossFit athlete that I am today is because he had to tell me the same kind of things. Cause I would ask him, are we sure we should do this much front squat? Like, am, am I going to be okay? Mm-hmm. Like, are you sure this isn't going to hurt me? And he'd be like, if you stop thinking about it and you just know that you're going to make the lift, then you're going to make the lift. Right. So he was very good about telling me to run my race, stop worrying about everybody else, do what you can do and like keep your blinders on and just focus on the task at hand and complete it and then move on. So I think that he instilled that in me initially that year one and then it worked and I loved that attitude about it and then I've just kept it and tried to instill it in other people a little bit like just enjoy what you're doing love what you're doing right and do it like work just stop talking work hard and you're gonna get the results you want many times like elite elite athletes don't make the best coaches you know most and, times yeah yeah and 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 that's also something that's unique. You really like to coach. You really like to teach. I do. You really like to program. You like to get on the board and, you know, and there are a lot of people in the gym that know they can kind of come to you and you're going to, you know, you get happy to get on the whiteboard and start writing stuff down and figuring that out. Why is yeah. that something that's passionate, a passion for you and unique to you? So I think that came from when I stopped playing soccer as a scholarship athlete, that was my job at the time. So that was what I was getting paid to do. I knew that I didn't want to not have any kind of income and I knew that I loved exercise, but I needed to find a job to replace that income that I was getting from being a division one scholarship athlete. So I became a personal trainer. I took the cert at the time, which I think was AFA, AFA, whatever it's called. So I took that cert, became a personal trainer and then started doing personal training in the, our recplex, which was our gym or our school's gym. And then from there became a group fitness instructor, then started essentially learning how to coach and be a good coach and realized how much I loved that I got to instill exercise on other people. And I loved to make it fun. And I loved telling people because I was getting exercise science degree at the same time, I was figuring out how to use that knowledge and to actually put it into work and get other people's success out of it. And I just thought it was really cool. And I loved seeing people get excited about their results. So when I stopped, when I became, um, when I graduated, went home, started working at this gym that was the CrossFit gym that I started going to. And I started working there as a very basic, like I taught, this was still, they were still doing non-CrossFit classes on top of their CrossFit classes. They were more of a global gym with lots of machines and they were just kind of adding in some CrossFit. So I still taught the abs class and the mm-hmm. ladies only class in that night. And I did a whole lot of boot camp stuff, but then got my level one and then slowly started teaching CrossFit once I learned the movements a lot better. And then the same kind of thing. Like I started coaching for year for a couple years before I actually became very competitive. So I essentially I had the coaching base first mm. and then got competitive and then kind of switched roles. So I was a full-time coach all the way through 2015 while I was still a competitive athlete. And then when I came down here, I switched to just competitive athlete and no longer full-time coach. So I kept that coaching role for so long that now that I don't do it all the time, I, I miss that. I mean, and I'm the coach that you probably have seen in many gyms that like when you get your first pull up, you're excited, but mm-hmm. I'm like freaking ecstatic. Like yeah. I can't, I'm so excited for you because I've seen that transformation. And when I was a full-time coach at, um, which four barrel CrossFit, which is the gym that I was at in Indiana, I was head of every single new person that came in. So I taught all of our one oh one. So every single person that came into the gym for those two years, I met first, I got to take through six weeks of programming. I got to teach them, essentially be their first experience to CrossFit and then to see those people grow and see how much they can improve is just, I mean, it's the coolest thing to me. And I love being able to be a part, whether it's through my backstory or just through coaching, like I love to be a part, hopefully a memorable part of someone's experience in CrossFit or to be because of that cue you gave me, I was able to do this thing and to go back to my real life scenario. And like, it was just the stories of like the little old lady that came to me and couldn't wait to tell me that she had moved her couch all by herself. Like those kind of things just get me so fired up. And I think those real life scenarios are just the coolest thing. So I love coaching and to be that kind of shining light in someone's path on their own journey through CrossFit or athletics, whatever it is. Yeah, that's awesome. Is that what you see yourself doing after you finish competing or where do you see yourself after you finish competing? Yeah. So, I mean, I would love to keep coaching in some capacity. I don't really have a huge desire to own my own gym because I'm not business minded. I'm such a people person that I like to talk to people, work with people, be involved with people that... I don't know that I want to go to the business aspect, but what I essentially, what I would love to do is I also have a very strong love in my heart for teaching and working with kids that have disabilities. Mm -hmm. My uncle has cerebral palsy. So I've been around disabled people my whole life and have, I taught a couple adapted PE classes while I was in college and while I was a grad student and took them and was a TA and all kinds of stuff because I loved it. 
And I think there's a huge open field that hasn't been tapped into for not physical therapy or occupational mm-hmm. therapy, but actually exercise training for kids that have disabilities. Because a lot of times they go through those things and they it's part of their school regimen, but they do they don't do actual exercise with the muscles. They're mm-hmm. stretching the joints and they're standing them up and they're sitting them back down, but they're not pushing them to walk on their walker for 15 steps or mm-hmm. to make it fun, which is kind of what I learned through this adapted PE class that I did in college was that if you make it fun, they're just kids and they just want to play. And oh, yeah. yes, they're non, like they, they're non ambulatory and they can't walk, but like you can still make games for them. Mm-hmm. They still just want to play games and they're still, they are excited about exercise if you can get them excited about it. And I think that it, there would be a lot, I don't know this, but I am hopeful that there would be a lot more te- or kids that don't have to be in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. If we push their legs to be Mm-hmm. active when they're younger because yeah. a lot of times we're like uh, you're probably going to be in a non-ambulatory so here's a wheelchair and we'll just push you around for the next five years as opposed to pushing them to get their muscles to actually be active so they don't become dormant and we can get them activated so i would love to hopefully be a part of that at some point someday i think that would be really cool it would be a whole nother passion that i am uh very passionate about that i just haven't had the time to put a whole lot of effort into so i would love to act on that in some way too i could see facilitating that we had uh, an adapted aquatics program in college that I went to. And it was like, I mean, talk about seeing children come alive. Like it was incredible. Yeah. But do you want to, so we did an event last year for uncle Phil involved. Do you want to talk about that? That was really cool. Yeah. So we, um, went to Owens, he lives in Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, this was a gym in Owensboro that held an event for, uh, a couple of different reasons. It was a big charity event. One of the charities that they went to was Wendell Foster Center, which is where my uncle lives. So they brought in a couple of residents, my uncle and two other guys that Ellie, myself and Kristen so got to do a workout with. So we <laughs> took them to the front. We did a relay. So we like put a plate on their lap. They held on to it. We like took them through relay. I think we did five pull-ups or something yeah. and then get, took the plate back, gave it back to them and then went through a whole relay. So they got involved in the exercise which is awesome. And you could like, Ellie got to meet them. I mean, they're completely involved. It's super exciting. So I love being able to do events like that. And if I can start that early and get them excited about exercise, then it's You should it's see so cool. Lindy race her uncle's wheelchair. I thought fire was going to shoot out of the back. I was like, can we round the turns that fast? And she's like, ah! Uncle Phil's like, yeah. He it was it. awesome. It he was wasn't really going to cool. let me lose, that's for sure. I mean, cool. He would have fallen out of the wheelchair and been like, fine with it if we won. It felt like a disappointment <laughs> to our partners. I mean, they were on two wheels. It was unbelievable. Super fun. Yeah. Yeah, that was a blast. That was that was really cool. So, Jim, do you want to – so here's a uh, little wisdom. I know you oh, have wisdom. a lot of wisdom to share, so I, I thought I'd find like that, a, a thought on wisdom. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> and see what your two cents were. So you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. This is an open, open table question. Do you guys agree with this or disagree? You're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Environment shapes you for sure. So I think foundationally, I, I like that idea for sure. I think, hmm, I have to think about that. I, yeah, I like that. I think there's some things early on in my life that, that I absolutely hated Mm-hmm. You know, and I didn't want to be like that, and it drove me to be a different way. Um, yeah. And at present, like, do you think the people yeah. you hang out with the most kind of? You know what? I can tell you can this. You reflect that or no? You know, like new experience for me personally is, I think when Rich said, "Hey, won't you come down to the gym and and just kind of work out and be around us?" You know, um, I drove away twice. I didn't show up. It's been a long time since I was worried. Ghost or, wrote it. I did. <laughs> Like well, I, I really know who I am and I know what I'm about and I'm almost 50 and I'm super comfortable and the thought of being around you guys working out really threw me for a spin. It was one of those things, man, I was like, I can't go in there. I don't belong there at all physically, you know, um, that's just not where I'm at. I'm still learning and I don't want to be in that place. Mm-hmm. And so it really challenged me. And so for sure, if we looked at that question, man, I'm getting fitter and just being in the environment and, and watching and learning, um, it's definitely changing my life yeah. for sure. So I, yeah, man, you gotta, you gotta be careful. There's no question. What do you guys think? I think it's true. I mean, you notice that if you hang, <clears throat> if you like, if you're around somebody that you know pretty well and they start hanging out with another group of people or whatever, you can tell that they start to pick up some of their tendencies and stuff like that. So I, I'd say it's pretty true, pretty accurate. So you got to be careful on who you surround yourself with. Uh, I kind of think yes and no. Um, because I think I 
am the sum of the five people that I have in my life spent the most time with overall, mm-hmm. as opposed to the five that I spend the most time with right now. Because I think that I spend the most time with you guys, obviously, because I'm you here with you every single like day. You don't think you're just like us? <laughs> <laughs> just and I know I'm not just like you. So, but I, I, of course, yes, I'm going to like get influence from that, mm-hmm. but I still think me at my core and who I am is a sum of everyone that I've been around my whole yeah. life. That Does that make sense? sense? There could be a couple levels. That, like yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, I don't think you're exactly the five people. Right, you of hang course. With. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna get like stuff off of them. Yeah. But I still think you as a well, depending on where you are in your life, if yeah. you're comfortable how with the person you are and the way you yeah. are, yeah. How, depending on how much influence will affect you, I think for the most part, you could be the sum of the people that you have spent the most time with in your life. That's I want to be like you know, if you want to go a little bit deeper, I I live my life based on a very clear, defined set of core principles, Mm -hmm. a code. And I want to be able to be in an environment where everybody in the room doesn't agree with me, doesn't like me, and I can still be that man. I can still be that person. And so I think at at the foundation, I, you know, I think it's super important to be able to find yourself and know who you are so that no matter where you are, no matter what environment you're in, you're that same person. And then, you know, depending on what you're doing, I want to be able to play offense in a negative environment, be able to person who can make a difference and and I think you have to manage and pay attention to what that environment is. I like that. Are you guys ready for a random fact? Oh, and this is something go. to do with another question for you. Okay, first question. Where in the world do you think, or, you know, top two places you think have the most pickpockets? I learned this this morning. Most pickpockets. One in Brazil. Is it Rome? <laughs> oh. I hope not. <laughs> it's Rome. Oh, Barcelona's no. one. Barcelona. Rome is two. So, oh, wow. on s- so that, I need a fanny pack. So what three things? So there's three things that you should do to protect yourself from pickpockets. I don't know if you guys agree with these. Wear a I want to see if I can pickpocket you guys by the end of the day. That's gonna, uh, I'm going to try that. Right. I'm leaving, so no. So, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing is... I don't is, carry my wallet, so... Um, If you're at a train station, since we're at train stations a lot in Cookville... Um, yep. There's one depot in town. <laughs> it's ice cream right across. I actually yeah. didn't even know that. that I didn't there was even a train know that station. either. There's not a train station. There's just a, the train goes through. <laughs> okay, there's not, so like, there's, there's not like, actually oh, a train station. No, no. It's oh, a museum. Say, the train go doesn't do go that. anywhere. Yeah, the train there's doesn't like, go Well, no, there's shot. a train that comes through, but it's like a, it's not a... Person train? Uh, no, it's oh, they, they carry sand or... What do they call it when people, as opposed, like cargo train versus passenger train? Passenger? I don't even know. Uh, I'm not up on my trains. No. Me neither. So when you're on your passenger train, you need to look for excessive fidgeting. So if you're if I'm fidgeting, I'm gonna probably take this is from as you. the pickpocketer or as uh, the, so you to be are not. trying as the to pickpocketee. <laughs> as the pocketee. <laughs> okay. As the pocketee. Correct. So that's what I was asking. <laughs> yes, as the pocketee. Autops- as the autopsiest. <laughs> that's the that's the word of the podcast. Uh, Hashtag pickpocketee. Uh, pick the, the pocket pick as the pocketee, you need to look for fidgeting. Well, you're not in England, so you don't need to actually <laughs> to speak in that <laughs> accent because Barcelona or Rome is not don't in it. Don't sound like that. Um, uh, I mean, that's fine. So excessive fidgeting. Okay. At each stop, if you're stopping a lot, you need to. Hold on to your bag as you stop, so someone can't run by and like grab it at the stop. Like right Hold before the bag. door, do right before the door opens, they're gonna <laughs> grab it. <laughs> and and then people. you need a crossbody satchel, so they Why can't just like, rip it off your arm. Why are you being so aggressive? I'm not. I'm excited. I'm. I can visualize. It. I'm in the train right now. I oh. see it. I'm wearing the satchel, and that's what I have to do. Can I wear satchel. a fanny pack instead? I'm not gonna wear a satchel. I what? Know. Can just, I wear a fanny pack right here? You should wear the okay. one that has the like the belly on it. Have it's, you seen that? It's called the gross man yes, one. Yes, they're <laughs> so <laughs> gross. So I won't. Have you seen those? The one it. where the guy's stomach is. There's like six of them that you can get. There's like, like a they, hairy they have one. them named Ugh. differently. Like there's the the fat one without Ew. any hair. There's a fat one oh. with Ew, hair. So there's like gross. there's they're pretty funny. I'm gonna get me and John one. Yeah, we're gonna wear them. I got pickpocketed on the way to Rome. The only time in my life that I've ever wanted to fight someone. Me, like, you know, you've seen fight or flight. I usually, like, hit the ground. I'm going down an escalator. There's no fight or flight it's with just you. Flight. It's just flight. I fought. It's actually panic and fall down. I didn't. I didn't fall down. I was in an, uh, going down an escalator to get to the bottom of the train, and I had my big, like, travel backpack, and I was on my way from Spain to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I kind of feel my backpack rustling. And I look back, the chick behind me has an armful of my belongings. 
And I was like, Oh wow! I didn't really know what to do, but I wanted to hit her. <laughs> so I was so you should mad. Have. You should take it, it back. It had my Invisalign retainer in the thing oh, that she no. had in my my That's teeth. That's what she's actually. Them teeth were crooked. I was so upset. Well, what happened? So I, I grabbed it and I go, <laughs> go, no! <laughs> oh, did you smack her on the nose too? No, I wanted to throw a punch her so you with bad. The but I was gonna miss a train. No, so, no, no. Stop so that. I said no, and I grabbed my stuff. And then I ran down the escalator, probably losing stuff, and I got For in the train. For those who can't but... see, you need to watch this on YouTube. Anyway, wow. so, so this whole thing. Because this so whole thing is being yes. acted out right now. Lindy's going to Rome, so I, I wanted am. her to feel protected. So now that you know about crossbody, fidgeting, okay. and whatever, do tell us about your trip to Rome. I am essentially going to Rome from December 13th to the 21st. Yeah. And we are going... Because I just went on a trip to Switzerland that John was supposed. John is my boyfriend. That John was supposed to <laughs> toothless John. Toothless, toothless John. John. He's we missing his front tooth. Savage. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have lots of pictures on here. Do you have that cute little baby one with uh, the fluffy hair and the suit? No, we'll get back to this. But I'm taking him. He <laughs> has you. a birthday in. Look December. at her Instagram. They're probably on there somewhere. There's, he's definitely on there. There is. He's turning. 30 in December, December 28th. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, he's also graduating with his master's in May. Uh, and I'm very proud of him for that because it's been a long road because he was a professional hockey player for three years, hence the missing tooth. But he is <laughs> Italian and has his whole life has wanted to go to Italy. And I went on this trip to Switzerland that he was supposed to be able to come on with me. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't able to because he needed to stay back here and work and couldn't take that much time off and was very sad about the fact that he wasn't able to travel. He's never traveled internationally unless it was to Canada. So I That doesn't count. Right. Which is kind of what he says. Yeah. So he said he's never traveled count. internationally. So I essentially told him one day when I got home, I said, well, why don't we just go to Rome? And he's like, yeah, that would be super fun. Let's do it. <laughs> super fun. And I said, no, like, seriously, let's go. Yeah. Let's book tickets tomorrow. Let's go to Rome. he's Italian, correct? He's Italian. He's always wanted to go. He's Didn't she just say She that? did say that. I did. Mm -hmm. Listening and skills, Ellie. Listening he skills. has always wanted to go. He still has family that lives over there. So he's very excited about it. And he can't wait to do nothing but drink wine and eat food. Because we were going to go is next. pretty good there. Well, I'm so excited. Of we, all the international he places, he wanted to go next year when he graduated. It was going to be like a graduation gift, but because it's going to be game season, there wasn't going to be a good time to go. So I said, "F it, let's just go in December. Like <laughs> literally, let's just buy tickets and let's go." So we, within a week, bought tickets, got everything ready, That's and so we're going fun. to Rome in December. Soon, super soon, actually. It's exciting. It's super exciting. I can't wait. That's going to be a blast. Uh, so I have one more random fact because you said thirty and you said meh meh meh. So oh. I. I learned this the other day. Man, man, man. Something. How does it go? Yo, you make the sound. Just ask the question. It's it's so it's just a a random fact. Okay. And since people dread turning thirty, there is a recent Harvard study that just came out that says if you manipulate your environment, you can. <laughs> there are mental and physiological things that happen. So, for instance, like. It was a soccer coach, actually, and she hangs, like, works out with the younger soccer crew and hangs out with – she's, like, in her 60s, and she always Ellie, hangs out don't with, go hang out at a preschool just because you <laughs> think it's going to make you younger. I was talking about for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the one complaining. Is that seriously You're what the, the study old one. is? Yeah, it changes physiological markers if you manipulate I hang out with my three-year-old a lot so and my six-month-old, and I don't not you crap my pants right now. <laughs> yeah. No, it, you feel younger. It keeps you younger physically and mentally. Uh, I just don't agree with that. Well, talk Talk to Harvard. Talk to Harvard. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Harvard. Hey, Harvard. <laughs> I'm just saying. To talk to you. I All right. Mean, I thought yeah. of a poll question Okay. What's while we were swimming. Poll question? Poll question. I kind of stealing it from... I listen to Dan Patrick's show, and they usually have a poll every day. So this like is a poll, poll question. question. If you could have a gym that you go to, like Mayhem, that has turf, has everything you need, whatever, but you can only go five days a week, or you could have a home gym... With everything you need, minus like turf, like in a garage or whatever barn like we have. But you can only work out by yourself all the time. Uh, oh, wow. This which is one an would easy you do? question. Oh, but that's yeah. an introvert. Five days a week. Yeah, me too. Because yeah. I like to go talk to Gym people. Gym five days a week. Me yeah. too. What would you say? I don't know. This is my question. Yeah, but I feel like this is like question? an introvert versus extrovert question. This is question. like any time you want to go, you can do whatever. Anytime. The other one is like you it's can only, only work out you can, and you have to go within their hours. Yeah, I like the people part. I like to connect with people. I don't. I wouldn't be great working out by myself all what the time. What if you could have one person at any time? Oh, then that would change things. Yeah. 
I really don't like to work, work out, out by buddy. myself all the time. So sometimes though, sometimes it's great. Sometimes. And and in the gym, you never get to work out by yourself ever. <laughs> right, that's true. Because you can do things with community and people. It doesn't have to be in a CrossFit gym. Crud, I, I don't know. That's that's really hard. All right, so let's backtrack here. Gym with five days, you have to go by their hours, and there are people always working out with you, or. You have a garage gym with everything you need that you can use at any time, any time, any time of day, night, whenever. But you can only have one other person with you. No, it can. You can use it. You could come here whenever. You could come to the gym whenever, but it has to be within the hours, and the other place you can do whatever do you, you want. You get to rotate the one person. That's you have what with I. You? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Or do you have to pick one person? What if that one person doesn't like working out right now? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about John? Yeah. <laughs> then I don't want to pick him. John goes in spurts where he'll get like super motivated to get out of breath all the time and then, and then won't do like, any lifting. And then he's like, I CrossFit. And then stupid. he's like, ah, I'm just going to lift all the time. You guys are stupid for doing your fitness <laughs> over there. But this, just yesterday he with said, that toothless I grin. need to get fit. Yeah, yeah, with that toothless grin of his. <laughs> Hillary calls him sweet John. He's, sweet he's not very Should sweet. but this? Huh? Darren? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Should I reject it? On? Yeah. Declined. Declined. Sorry, Sorry Danner. Question. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. I don't know. That's I don't a hard know why one. I thought of that. I'm, I'm glad sure. that it. We don't. We, we don't, don't have, have to choose. choose, choose. Yeah, we get to kind of do what we want to do. Just show up to the gym and do whatever. No, you're like an early morning. Get early rise early. You, yeah. you can. I like the morning. Yeah. I like doing. I like getting up and. I've always been an early riser. My dad has always woken up at 5 a.m. Yeah. or 5 by 6. I mean, he still – he owns his own law firm now and doesn't really need to go into the office but still will get there by 7 a.m. and then be done by noon. So I've just always been accustomed to waking up early with him and doing things. So I still do that and I still enjoy doing it. But I like doing stuff – in the morning early, but then I also really enjoy coming and hanging out with everybody in the afternoon. So I wouldn't really want to give that part up just so I can have right. the home gym aspect. Right. And if I had that one person, one person. I could switch that yeah, person. I think you'd have to switch that person because it would get kind of old working out the same person. Right. By the way, people are going to be like, oh, you're drinking coffee. This isn't coffee. It's not coffee. That's it was a mirage. Coffee. Yeah. It's a mirage. It's, a, it's actually rehydrate. Oh, I don't drink coffee. In a coffee cup? Well, because Yvette got mad because we had so many different, not mad, but she was saying that it looked kind of, your voice, your voicemail sounds nothing like you. How the hell did you do that swim workout? <laughs> that's <laughs> Darren. That's, that's what he was calling oh to gosh. talk about the swim workout because he couldn't believe that I did it. I <laughs> uh, love it. I'm going to tell him that I got all the times perfectly and oh, that he yeah. needs to he be better. flip out. You should, you should tell me you hit those times. Because I did awesome. That I was made really hard. One of one, Two. Two of them? Yeah. Was, yeesh. Um, so I heard this question the other day that I thought was awesome. I actually asked the guys this yesterday, and they just ignored me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. This is going to be a good question. Yes. Though. What are you most proud of that maybe people do not know about you? Ooh. I love that question. I think that's a great question. That's a hard on the spot question. You can think about it. You don't have to answer it right on the spot. You did ask them yesterday, and they didn't have answers? Yeah, they just kind of talked about something else. Yeah. Most proud about that nobody knows. It's a hard question. I mean, I feel like it, you can have you know think about it for a while like it's not you know if nothing comes to mind don't feel like i got nothing yeah that nobody knows about nobody. throws me there yeah it's i'm like, most like proud a secret proud accomplishment of like right. being a parent humble, you know? humble yeah. brag no question. so basically you're asking for a humble exactly brag like something that you but you're not going to go up to your friends and be like let me tell you why i'm awesome about this like it could have happened earlier in life or, that's what you're asking you know. me to do right now I know. <laughs> humble brag yeah they like the way that they put that I don't have a humble brag. That's fine. Right now. Your new dog, mom. You want to tell us about your new I am, child? But most people Titus. know about him. Uh, I do. I have a puppy named Titus. It's on her story all the time. He has standoff with deer every day. <laughs> that is hilarious. What does he do? He just... He's a coward. Um, he's <laughs> she a just throws it out there. sweet, sweet... A uh, snuggly little puppy that loves people, and I don't think he really knows that he's a dog. So he like likes to play with dogs, but would much rather be five feet from me at all times. And he will he's interested in everything, and he wants to s know about what's going on. But will literally, there's lots of deers in our neighborhood for whatever reason, and they'll stand there, and they'll stop when they see him. And once he gets a sight of him, he'll stop, but he literally won't move. He has no interest in chasing them. He doesn't want to go after them. He doesn't want to like attack them. 
And then as soon as they start advancing a little bit, if they take a step or two towards us, he immediately backs up <laughs> or he like goes behind my legs and wants to look between my legs at them. Cause he's still interested, but knows that, Oh, they're coming at me and they're big and I don't want to deal with this. And he'll back off. If other dogs come at him like Bowser, Jess and Darren's dog, he's definitely afraid of because Bowser has barked Bowser. at him a couple times. So Bowser he'll run away. A jerk. But, <laughs> so he's stand he is standing off with deer and we'll, we could if I don't pull him along or get the deers to move he'll he'll literally stand there for minutes I mean we've stood there for three minutes before and he's literally just staring not moving <laughs> if I even pull on his collar a little bit he'll like very slowly take a step <laughs> and then we'll backtrack a little bit because he just wants to see him but I just think it's really funny and cute because he's such a coward but he's cute and he's snuggly he does look really well cute. he was a rescue right he was. We took him from a family around here that we found on LSN, which is like the Craigslist of Tennessee. It's, better, as, no, it's better than Craigslist, I think. It's better than Craigslist. <laughs> Just kidding. And we've, uh, there was a family that put a picture up of him and said that we love him. He's a great dog. We just can't afford to take care of him anymore. And this was right before the games. So we couldn't say no to that and weren't going to get a dog until after the games. But he was sweet and we went and met him and he definitely needed some care but he was already a good dog that just loved people but because we fed him and took care of him and got the fleas off his body i think he just attached to us really quickly yeah he's so. awesome he's, he's a friendly great. dog he's a very friendly yeah he likes to be by your side at all times he does <laughs> yes he does he just likes to be around people for sure all right episode seven lindy barber yay Woo. thank you no, thank uh you very much. what else am i supposed to tell dre Leave a review, um, new apparel out, CrossFitMayhem.com. Is there anything? We have an event coming up. When is that, February? We have an, an Be on the lookout for that. We're going to do some type of workout. I think we're <laughs> – work Well, somewhere. we're going to do a couple workouts, know. but it's going to be a little team, guy-girl pairs. Um, we're working on the name and the logo right now, aren't we, Dre? Um, <laughs> be on the lookout for Mayhem for Mustard Seed will be in April I'm pretty sure it's the 21st but I don't, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to leak that yet but hey get ready for it uh, that'll be number <laughs> coming. 5 Mayhem for Mustard Seed number 5 cool wow. it's a it's a good good thing to support and um, we enjoy it so leave comments uh, whatever you want to talk about next time and see you next time